We will next have Mary Nichols, who is chair of the California Air Resources Board, a uh, post she has held since 2007. Ms. Nichols has devoted her entire career in public and nonprofit service to advocating for the environment and public health. Uh, in addition to her work at the Air Board, uh, she has served as assistant administrator for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Air Radiation Program under President Clinton and director of the Institute of the Environment at the University of California. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, however, one of the challenges of coming at this point in the program is that pretty much everything that's in my testimony that was prepared has been covered by other speakers. And I could just say thank you, but I'd, I think what I'd like to do is make a couple points that aren't really uh, covered or have not yet been covered uh, this morning. So let me start by saying that um, I've been the chair of the Air Resources Board. Actually, I'm on my fourth uh, term uh, doing this under uh, Jerry Brown and for several years also under Arnold Schwarzenegger when the state of California passed the first comprehensive climate legislation in the country. It was passed by a Democratic legislature uh, with no Republican votes, uh, but it also was signed by a, by a Republican governor. And the feature of it that I want to uh, stress is that uh, California set a goal uh, a, a target of bringing its emissions to 1990 levels by 2020, which at the time was the global uh, goal of the Kyoto Accord, and then gave the task of uh, meeting that to, uh, to my agency. Uh, it was given that task, frankly, because um, we've had the experience in California of reducing air pollution levels to uh, from uh, what were once uh, perhaps not as bad as we see in Beijing or New Delhi today, but uh, really uh, ugly and horrible uh, levels to a point where we still violate air quality standards in particularly Southern California and the Valley, and all too many times in low-income communities, disadvantaged communities, and communities of color. But at the same time, we've slashed emissions by over 90% twice. So in effect, uh, emissions today in California from any facility are uh, about 1% of what they were at the time I first started doing this work. And that's in a, a, a situation where our population has grown, our uh, vehicle population has grown even faster, and um, our economy has grown even faster than that. So we know that you can uh, push technology, that you can set very strong pollution goals, you can change your energy system, and you can do it in a way that actually benefits the economy. And that's what we think should be the policy of the Democratic Party. Uh, now, a lot has already been done over the last uh, seven years under the leadership of President Obama, and uh, frankly, in partnership and building on the work of many states and mayors, state governors and mayors, uh, progressive uh, uh, jurisdictions around the country, uh, we have seen uh, uh, goals set and we've seen um, very innovative solutions to changing our energy system away from one that is dependent on uh, petroleum. There was a lot of talk, there has been a lot of talk about transitions, uh, but the way to make a transition happen is not to just sit back and wait for something to happen. You have to tell the market where you want it to go, and you have to be prepared to make investments that will encourage it in the right direction. And you've heard some examples of that uh, here today. One that you haven't heard very much about, though, is um, the transportation sector, which uh, actually is responsible uh, in our state, and I believe now nationally, for more of our greenhouse gas emissions than, um, than the electricity system. And so I, I think it's important that we have a, a shared understanding that reaching the kind of ambitious climate targets that the Paris Agreement would call for, does call for, uh, as we look at it, while also trying to meet uh, air quality standards and, and protect human health um, is going to require us by 2050 to live in a world where uh, we are basically not burning 
anything uh, in order to power our economy and to move ourselves around. Uh, that the, the long-term goal here is really 100% renewability across the board. We're not going to get there immediately, but if we don't start putting the policies in place now, we can, I think, confidently predict that we won't get there. And what we have found so far in our work is that you need a combination of measures, that there is no one magic silver bullet that is going to get you there, that you need a mix of uh, both uh, sector-specific regulations, like the renewable portfolio standard that uh, requires our electrical utilities to deliver 50 percent of uh, all of the electricity as renewable energy uh, by 2030, or like the low-carbon fuel standard, which we adopted, that requires the companies that supply uh, our transportation fuel, meaning uh, gasoline and diesel, uh, to uh, reduce the carbon content of their overall fuel uh, by 10 percent by 2020. And what that has meant is investments in not only uh, cleaner uh, sources of uh, liquid fuels, uh, such as renewable diesel, primarily renewable uh, biodiesel, but also in the uh, oil companies literally buying credits from electrical companies who are installing electric charging stations to uh, make it possible for more people to be able to drive uh, electric vehicles. So. Uh, we see a, a future in which uh, we need to be using all of our ingenuity to try to spread the cleaner energies and the cleaner technologies around the state. And the issue of environmental justice, as, as Vianne spoke to uh, earlier, is one that has been uh, part of our overall climate strategy from the very beginning. And it's not there just because um, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do, although that is a fact. Uh, but it's there because um, you can't make the targets without dealing with the fact that um, the, uh, the consumers, the uh, young people who are coming into the world need to have access to the clean technologies, and they can't get there by a trickle-down program. There has to be direct investment made uh, in communities so that people will have the ability to take advantage of solar panels, to take advantage of advanced technologies in metering their electricity, or uh, find ways to uh, move around in vehicles that don't, uh, that aren't gas guzzlers, which is uh, where we find the, the, the place where we can really turn over the fleet, is through programs that target uh, the oldest and dirtiest cars and make it possible for the people that are um, flunking their smog check tests to turn them in and uh, not just get a slightly cleaner car, but get a car that actually uh, could be a zero emitting vehicle, that that's a better investment of the funds that the state acquires. We do also then have a cap on emissions that enables us to know that we're getting to the target that we set. And we created a, a market program of allowances, a cap and trade program, which um, gives away uh, to the uh, largest stationary sources in the state about 90 percent of the allowances that they need to operate based on their level of efficiency. So it rewards people for being more efficient in terms of how much they produce for their uh, amount of emissions. But 10 percent of the allowances are required to be auctioned, and it's the auction revenue that Vienne was referring to that is then uh, reinvested in the programs that are designed uh, to help reduce emissions and also to um, benefit directly the disadvantaged communities. But um, that uh, program was adopted as, a, as our means of putting a price on carbon because it was something we could do quickly, relatively quickly, by administrative action rather than waiting for uh, the legislature to be able to adopt a tax. Uh, that would have been, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have that today if we'd had to, if we'd had to wait for the tax. So um, I think maybe I see a gavel being raised there that I should stop and just say that um, we are uh, eager to work uh, with the national party and to continue to work with the administration as we have uh, for the last seven years uh, to be able to build on some of the leadership that we've seen from states and locals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Browner. Um, thank you, and it's an honor to have uh, Mary with us today, a former colleague and a real leader uh, in this field. 
you, you noted that there's no silver bullet, that you have had to embrace a whole array of policies, that it's not just about stationary sources, it's also about mobile sources, that there's a lot of sources that need to be addressed and you need a, a lot of tools to do that. Did you guys consider a ban on fracking as you looked at all the various uh, tools and, and, and the kind of decisions that you could take? This has been a very um, active issue in California, uh, as it has every place else. Uh, California is in a slightly different position, I think, from the Northeast in the sense that we have had a lot of experience with oil and gas development in California over many decades. Um, and so uh, it, fracking turns out to be a name for a suite of different kinds of technologies that are used to produce oil and gas. And uh, it was actually going on um, in many situations where people didn't even know what was happening. So the first step has been to try to get a handle on what was really going on out there and then to develop a, uh, a regulatory program to deal with the water and air and other uh, implications of that activity. But I think that the attitude of the governor and the legislature that prevailed after the discussion about should there just be a ban uh, because California probably could have done this uh, on its own, was that we needed to take a look at how we were using petroleum. It's a little bit like banning um, the manufacturing of drugs and not doing anything about the demand uh, side. You know, as long as we continue to be such a large uh, uh, producing, uh, excuse me, not just producing, but consuming state, um, that it didn't seem like it was right to sort of focus only on one aspect of the production side. But it uh, clearly needed and is now finally, I think, beginning to get a uh, much greater degree of attention than it, than it had before. Call out for the committee members. California really is the lead on reducing carbon uh, pollution. Um, it is amazing what the state has done. Uh, it is, uh, I think, a testament to the governor's leadership, but also to Mary's lifelong commitment and, and leadership, and we thank you for what you have done. Skulls. Uh, th thank you very much for your uh, testimony. Uh, re uh, really appreciated what you had to say. Uh, but what one of the concerns, of course, is, is, is fracking again. And I, I wanted to uh, point out a report uh, by the American Geophysical Union uh, talking about uh, f how fracking can cause earthquakes uh, several miles away, uh, not only in the short term, uh, but months or even years after the process takes place. Uh, so my question to you, of course, uh, California knows a thing or two about earthquakes. Uh, how concerned are you uh, about uh, fracking in California uh, leading to more earthquakes there? The uh First of all, quite a bit of the fracking that we found was going on actually was happening um, in areas uh, off the coast and not actually in the si most seismically active areas of the state. Uh, the places where there might in the future have be a consideration are areas where, to, where it's very, very expensive to get at the petroleum that's already there. Um, the water that's produced by, um, uh, by the oil development process um, it has to be uh, cleaned up under our requirements, and it actually is used for other purposes. Uh, it's not just re-injected. But I'm going to defer that question to my colleague, who's, I think, right up after me, uh, Felicia Marcus, because she's got the assignment of actually um, dealing with the water side of the, of the fracking process, whereas uh, my my agency has focused primarily on the air side, and our concern was that we get full disclosure of the chemicals that are used, that the industry not be able to hide behind the idea that these are proprietary formulas that couldn't possibly be disclosed for competitive reasons. Uh, we think that's uh, unacceptable. And so we've worked with uh, communities and with our local air agencies to come up with, uh, uh, come up with the regulations that deal with that piece of it. Thank you very much. Thank you.